Hi everyone, welcome to Footy Talks. Footy Talks. Footy Talks. Presented by Powerade. We are live with your Thursday Footy Fix. And welcome along to the show. Great to be with you once again. It is the MLS Cup Playoff Edition of Footy Talks presented by Powerade. And we are now just a day away from the opening of the MLS Cup Playoffs and the game that we will have on TSN on Friday night to kick it all off, Montreal Impact at New England Revolution. Boys, we were in the studio yesterday to do the MLS Cup preview show, which aired last night. It was a whole lot of fun. But I think uh, one of the things that came out of it is that Really, no one has any idea what's going to happen right now over the course of the next three weeks as MLS tries to crown a champion, especially KJ, given the situation with which players will be available, which players won't be. Will home advantage count this time around? No fans in most of the stadium. So much up in the air as we head into the postseason, but uh, just great to be here once again. Great to be here. Great to have a, a you know a tournament style about to kick off over three weeks and a day where you know a couple of where a big tournament will happen and a, and a trophy will be awarded, as we said yesterday. That is the great thing about sports. That's what we look forward to. Stevie and I always talk about it. No matter when you, you know, when you see that team win, you get that feeling, and you know it's wonderful to see. It. And one of those teams, one of these teams, is going to do that. You know, we don't. We you know we will not allow twenty twenty to shock us anymore. Okay, so anything, <laughs> we're ready for it. Right, we're ready. That's how we felt. I did a show yesterday with a few other broadcasters in the states. JP Della Camera, uh, Casey Keller, Max Bretos amongst them, and they were the same. Everyone's feeling the same. We'll talk to Taylor Twelman and Michael Bradley on this show in a second. And Stevie, it is. Um, you know, it is wide open. Luke has already, you know, written off San Jose, but other than that, <laughs> everybody else can win it. I think. Yeah, it's wide open. I'm not writing off San Jose. They were my pick at the start of the season. I think they're just coming good at the right point. So pick for what? Hey, listen, they could <laughs> win it. I'm telling you that right now. They win that first game, which will be very, very difficult. They could win this tournament, and that's what makes it so exciting. Everybody's in it. It's very open. It's uh, it's up for grabs. If things are up in the air. Who's going to play? Like you said. Look, who's uh, you know, is home field advantage really going to count? I'm not even sure it is. I think that these teams, I hope, are going to tackle it in the right manner and be very positive, and and try and win the games rather than you know try not to lose them. So uh, that's the only thing that I hope. That's what we got last year, and if we get that again this year, we're in for an exciting few weeks, guys, because uh, there's some top football players in this league now, and there's some great teams, and I think there's some very exciting matchups coming up. Toronto FC will find out Friday night who they will be playing in the first round of the playoffs on Tuesday. TFC will head back over the weekend to Hartford, Connecticut, where they've uh, had their home games, of course, since September. Uh, but it's been great for them to be home for the last couple of weeks to be able to train at their home facility. We'll talk to Michael Bradley about that a little later on in the show. And Taylor Twelman makes a second appearance. I think a lot has happened since the first time Taylor joined us, which was sometime mid-May, I think, before the MLS is back tournament. But uh, you'll hear a lot of Taylor on the ESPN broadcast throughout the playoffs. So TSM will have every single game uh, from the postseason for you, coast to coast, across Canada. A um, couple of things. First off, Stevie, are you staying for the whole show this week or are you going to bail on us again after about 20 minutes? I'm going to stay for the whole show this week. My apologies for, for leaving early last week. Oh, no. it was not because I had a hangover, which I think you two guys alluded to in the show. It was because the I had a very bright. The, after, after a Scotland big win, the lights were too bright. Okay. <laughs> I did have a hangover, but that's not why I left. I left because I had some really important... You're really important. ...holding the ship yeah. for me, guys. I appreciate it, and uh, I'm sorry I missed the, the second half of the show. The big news, though, Luke, is that the, the big breaking news of the show is that Stevie has two soccer pictures up on the wall behind him. <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah. if you notice this now... This I'm going to add a different one every week to try yeah. and get a bit of personality in this back wall. All I'm seeing, and, I, and it's a long way away, and uh, for those listening back on the podcast, you have to check the video, but all I'm seeing right now is a row of, a, of, of players in white, which could be in England kits, but I don't yeah. think it'll be England. <laughs> wow. I think it's probably you and your brother for Scotland. Is that who I'm guessing? So it's two of my favourite pictures. Uh, a bit dark, can't quite see them at the back there. But it's the top one's my brother and I. Someone caught us in conversation talking about someone or other on a Scotland trip. I think we were in Wales. I think we were going to play Wales in, in that trip. 
And then the other one on the right is my brother and I, and you know, obviously nine other guys lining up for Scotland against Norway in Oslo in a, a very disappointing match for us, but a, a big match for Gary and I in terms of lining up together and Darren Fletcher's there, I think Chris Commons, um, Scott Brown, I can't see them in this this camera, but David Marshall's there, the hero from, from Thursday. He played in that game, Marshy. So there's some some great guys, some great players, and uh, you know, my most important one, my brother's right next to me. So it's two two special pictures for me. I think I'll add one every week, guys, and we can chat about what pictures going up next week. Uh, talking about the hero from last Thursday, that's a long way in the past. It's all come off the rails now for Scotland, hasn't it, the last week or so? So we should probably move on and, you know, talk yeah. about something else. It wasn't the one that mattered. It's been a terrific week. We won the one that mattered. We played really, really well in the second one against Slovakia. I don't think we, we played so well against Israel, and it's, it's bitterly disappointing. We would have been, you know, uh, loved to have played in that Group A. We would have obviously been eligible for the playoffs again if we didn't make it through World Cup qualifying. So it was a it was a big loss. And, I, you know, I think it puts things into perspective. Let's remember that, you know, we are, uh, with all due respect, an average side who have many facets of our, our game that need to be worked on, but they will be, and we'll be ready for uh, the Euros, and we'll be particularly ready for England. Look, there was enough Scotland talk last week. We had to, but we won't now, so let's move on. I, I want to know, by the way, how how long it took you to get those pictures exactly to the top of your head and just to the side of your ear as well. Did, was it well, I, can move, I can actually move my table. I move this table back and forward uh, to frame it how I like, so... Right. I just put them up, they're probably not even the right dimensions in the wall, but they, they fit the frame, they'll work for the moment. TV Ikea Caldwell. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the playoffs then for the MLS Cup playoffs that start tomorrow. Um, it's one and done like it was last year when the, it's almost a, a real race to the finish as soon as the games start. Um, Stevie, you said on the preview show yesterday, and I saw someone just mention in the comments, it was Matthew, um, he can't see anyone beating Philadelphia. Certainly at home... Um, they've won every single game they've played this year and it got them the Captain America Shield. Um, so are they the team that you think everyone in the East has got to struggle with here? Because Philly, of course, have home advantage all the way through. And if so, can anyone beat them from the West if they, they have to go into Subaru Park in MLS Cup? Uh, difficult one. I think they're awesome at home. I think they're probably the best team in MLS in the regular season. And I will stress that there's a lot of pressure on them. And this is the first time that they've really had the spotlight on them. So that's the only thing up for debate with me. Can they handle that? Can they, they deal with a game where maybe things aren't working so well and you just have to scrape out a victory and, and find a way of doing it? So, you know, that, that's the big unknown. But I, I do believe that they are the best team. I do believe they're playing the best football. Now they have to translate that into the playoffs. And, uh, you know, I'm sure there's some others, KJ, that are going to have some things to say about that. Um, TFC, I'm going to be speaking to Captain Michael Bradley shortly. I think we'll still fancy their chances, even though they had a disappointing, heavy defeat there recently. But there's, there's some team, aren't they? They know what they're all about. They've got things going, and if they can keep everybody fit, I think they've got the best, the best eleven. Yeah, they've got a great identity about them. They're a team, a proper team that we've liked for a long time, and um, you know, a team that grew up a lot in Florida. You know, a team that didn't win it, but I thought got better as it went on, and then a team that needed to win that shield, a team that needed something to stand up for what they've accomplished over the last few years. This is not just by accident, a season out of nothing. This has been building for a couple of seasons now. They've lost US Open Cup finals uh, very narrowly over the last three or four years, um, too many of them, and they needed to win something. And now they've won something. Can that you know, you know, can that boost them go forward again and boost them to, to you know know how to win? And I think that's really important. Once you know how to win, then you add you add an extra armor, I guess, to your to your to your bow, I suppose. So I just think that the only thing I would say about that is that you know I do feel like they're destined to lose a game. I, you know, they have been really good at home, and they've had a lot of things go well for them. And in the playoff scenario, where as I said, you can play well and lose, I think that that could happen. And and, and you know. You know, they probably won't get beat to the team that they play in the first game. I just think they're too strong for that. But Orlando or New York, I think we'll go to that game thinking we can beat them. Um, and I think they might. And by the way, people said about TFC last year having to go into New York City, although it was City Field rather than Yankee Stadium, a New York City side that had finished uh, at the top of the East. And then going into Atlanta, not many people gave them a chance as well. And, and if you look at Toronto FC, the experience that they've had on the road, 
um, in big playoff games. And they go to Philadelphia last time, of course, without a number of players. If you've got a strongest TFC lineup available for an Eastern Conference final, um, and Philly are there with that that weight that you talk about, having won the Supporters' Shield and never having made it to an MLS Cup and not lost at home all season, um, TFC would fancy their chances, wouldn't they, going in, into that environment like that? Yeah, TFC will fancy their chances really? against everyone. Sorry, KG. They, yeah, they, it's fine. We've seen it before, haven't we, that they'll be up for it against anyone. TFC, they'll fancy their chances. I think that, um, for me, the top five in the East are, are, are comfortably the best, KG. I, I think you'll agree with me there. We're Orlando, mm-hmm. New York City. Columbus, of course, TFC and Philly. So once uh, once we find out the winner of that Orlando New York City game, then we're going to get, you know, I think some really tasty matchups where everybody can can win that one. Uh, you know, the, the sort of semi final conference semi final matchup. But um, but I just think with Philly, I've not seen and, and correct me if, if you guys have seen anything different. But in twenty three games, I've not really seen a team with a tactical plan that really hurt them. That really got at them. That really started to, you know, push their buttons. I think that there's been times where they've looked like they've not found the answers themselves, particularly in front of goal. But I think defensively and structurally, they're a really hard team to get at. Nobody's really found a formation or a way of hurting them down the sides or, or getting in behind them or anything like that. KJ, they've been so solid as well, which goes a little bit unrecognised. I think. Yeah, the continuity is there. They understand each other. They play together so many minutes. Um, they need Blake, though. You know, we'll find yeah. out whether the goalie's ready because if there's, if there's not, if throw everything we've just spoke about for the last five minutes in the garbage, if he's not playing, because it don't matter. It's a massive blow to them. So they need him back. By all accounts, they think that he will be back, but we'll have to wait and see. Um, he's an enormous part of what they've done there. The defense is very difficult. The, 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 the structure is a good word. They're a very difficult team to break down. And um, the only thing they don't really have, and I love Martinez, and he, he was my newcomer of the year, and I know I was in a minority for that. He was in my team 11, best 11 of the year. I know he was a minority for that. The only thing they don't really have is they don't have that one player that can do something like that out of nothing and win you a game. You know, they got good players. You know, in Montero and Badoya, they got tr- tremendous players. Aronson's had a great year. But have they got that one player that can produce something out of nothing just to get you over the line when you don't play well? Maybe they do, maybe they don't. I'm not sure they do at that point. And that might be a bit of a problem for them, potentially, Stevie, in, in, in a game of this magnitude. Yeah, I think that's why when it's a tight game, we, they, they struggle to find an answer when they're, when it's working and everything's rolling. They're a difficult team to play. But, you know, as we know, we've, we've covered them for four or five years, guys. There's going to be games here that are tight, that nothing's happening. And it's usually when the superstar steps up, big DP, the moments that we can remember for Altidore or, or Javinko, Pete Martinez, any of these guys with, with big moments through the years, Almiron, you know, with, with big, big plays, the superstars usually come up with them. And I, I don't see that guy in the union side that's going to have to be a team effort right to the very end. And I think that's what we so admire about the union, that they are such a team and they know they're going to have to rely on each other to get the job done. And congrats to Jim Curtin as well, friend of the show. He's been on here two or three times this year on winning the MLS Coach of the Year Award. So well deserved. Um, I'm going pretty well, actually, with my uh, my votes right now. I, I even got assistant referee and referee of the year correct today with my, my votes. So And you got defender of the year right as well, Luke. You, I absolutely uh, got defender of the year right, much to yeah. the disappointment of both of you boys. Yeah, you but, ate all that up. Huh? That propaganda from the uh, from south of the border, you just ate it all up, right? <laughs> Walker Zimmerman was MLS He's a good player. player. He's a good player. Good player. Very no, good player. Uh, yeah, not yeah. disappointment from us. We just felt there was a couple others that deserved it before him. Okay, who did you two vote for? Go on, KG. Anton Tinnerholm, I voted for. Okay. Mark McKenzie. But either way, I think both of those two, I think they played tougher opposition in structures that forced them to be braver, that didn't sit on the back, you know, didn't sit on their 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 their, their goal line pretty much, the you know, the box uh, in a structure that was very difficult to break down and not taking anything away from him. He's a very good defender. Um, but yeah, you're right, Luke, seeing that you're patting yourself on the back, congrats. You got them all right so far, yeah? Yeah, but pretty much apart from newcomer of the year. I think I, I voted for Berich and I think Zilla Ryan got it. Yes. Okay. Berich is probably a good pick too, mate. You got well, that one. That's pretty good. He was robbed then, wasn't he? Let's bring in Taylor Twelman, um, MLS legend. <laughs> ESPN analyst. We'll see a lot of him north of the border here in Canada. Uh, we've upset you before you even come on. Tell I'm not happy with us. Are, are you really patting yourself on the back for getting the assistant referee correct? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
If it was just one in a, if it was just you know uh, one in a in in nine defeats, then I wouldn't. But the fact that it it pretty much keeps going my one hundred percent. I think you're the only one that voted. Yeah, I believe that because I know I didn't. Yeah. I well, that's, that's why that's why I got it right because there you go else the Luke uh, Warman award yeah <laughs> uh, no I like the officials I'm not like Caldwell who has uh, shunned them since he uh, he came into not true. I've been good to the officials I've been good to them I'll say when they make a mistake but I'll also say when they get it right and I'll say when I get it wrong Taylor and I, you know I've gave an opinion and when you look at the back in the replay they made a brilliant decision what a hard job wouldn't like to do it would you uh, no, and quite frankly, I don't like officials. Uh, never really enjoyed their company. And um, the fact that they need replay because they're what human is ridiculous. Uh, I'm with you, it's got no chance. No chance. We're, we're on the eve of the MLS Cup playoffs, Taylor. And I wonder if you at any point during this season, like uh, we spoke to uh, Jeff Agus last week, and, and mm -hmm. Commissioner Don Garber said a few weeks ago on one of the media calls that there were times this year when he thought that Major League Soccer might not even make it to the playoffs and yeah. in terms of everything that was going on. How big an achievement do you think it is for the league just to be in this position right now? I mean, to be honest with you guys, I thought it was an achievement to pull off MLS's back because the moment we heard FC Dallas and that plane ride that turned into an absolute debacle, we saw what Nashville did sitting on the bus for two hours knowing that someone was positive and yet they didn't get off the bus. I, I was sitting there in Bristol, Connecticut, going, there's no way they pull this off. There's absolutely no way. So it's an accomplishment in itself. And you guys saw it a little bit with the Blue Jays and what they had to do. Major League Baseball, That I mean, 60% of the St. Louis Cardinals games were seven innings because they missed so many games. So the fact that we had some kind of competition, I will never say that it was balanced. I will never say that there should be an asterisk, even though I do think Philadelphia Union should celebrate the Supporter Shield, rightfully so. Um, the fact that we're doing these playoffs, yeah, it is something. I will say, though, you guys know how this country is going right now in this moment. I still have my fingers crossed that they get through this playoffs because we saw with USL and what happened there, there's still a few major roadblocks, Luke, I think, to be able to pull this off. Yeah, and Taylor, we saw them come out yesterday. You know, obviously, ESPN colleague and good friend of ours, Jeff Carlisle, you know, basically said that there's teams that could lose here be forfeited. You know, that they, 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 that's part of the reason why they want to get this in. We've seen that happen as well with Nations League games as well. Mm -hmm. So I think it's clear that they had to be strong, did they not, in the message here that, look, you know, it, it, it might suck that if we have to forfeit some games here, but we want to lift the trophy come December 12th. Yeah, you don't want the embarrassment that USL had. And, and make no mistake about it, every single MLS owner, whether you're in the playoffs or not, doesn't want that. And so I do think behind the scenes, I think the message was much sterner than what that PR message was yesterday from Major League Soccer. And yet, I still look at it. Very difficult decision, in my opinion, to have this congested schedule right after the international break. If it was up to me, I would have delayed it a little bit. I know Major League Soccer will say that it was up to the television partners. It doesn't matter here or there what it was, but you are bringing in the international travel into now the MLS bubble, which they've done a fairly good job of dealing with it, minus what happened in Colorado. That's where... Chris, that's where I'm nervous about the entire yeah. thing because my word, I, I don't think we know the ramifications of the international travel right now when we're talking. Maybe call me Monday next week. Maybe call me right after Thanksgiving here in the United States. Then it may be a different situation. But I think you're playing with a little bit of fire here. And what would you like to see happen there then, Taylor? Like, Because there's not a lot of time, is there, to get it in. So how could they have done it? Like, Is it just uh, you know the circumstances meaning that they had to go and they had to keep their fingers crossed. Yeah, I mean, I, honestly, I would have just moved it to next Tuesday being the playing games and right. just giving yourself a full week after the international break to assess what's going on and to see, and you still would have been able to pull off the final on December 12th. You still would have had the, the, the semifinals on the 6th on our – so everything would have worked. I just would have delayed it a little bit so the players can get back, you can assess it, and you can give them the 72 hours. You guys know this better than anyone because Canada did a fantastic job at the beginning. If you give it the 72 hours to assess after travel, it does give you a pretty good indication of who's negative, who's positive, and then you can move forward. But look at LAFC right now. 
right? It, 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 you go out, you spend the money for the charter, you try to get everyone back. You can't even get them back because they're positive now in South America with three of those four players, and we still don't know about Brian Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. I just would have given yourself a little bit more of a leash to maybe figure this out so your best players are available for the tournament. The first game we have is tomorrow night, uh, Montreal Impact at New England Revolution. Mm -hmm. And Thierry Henry saying just a few moments ago in his media call that Victor Wanyama isn't back and isn't available for that game. So they're without Wanyama, who was with Kenya. They're without Samuel Piet, who was suspended. So he's got issues uh, heading into that game at Gillette Stadium for sure. But that one's tomorrow night on TSN. Um, you're a very privileged position for a number of reasons, Taylor. But one of them is that we've not actually seen a TFC home game in Hartford. And I believe yeah. you have. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. So I, this is, I, I'm, I'm nervous scratching my head because I'm going to admit something publicly. I've not, I have not gone to a soccer game since I've retired that I haven't been working or received some recognition for. Because obviously you guys know me well enough. It's all about me. It's, I don't care about <laughs> but, it, and that was, I, I literally packed up the cooler. We took five of us from ESPN. We went to a game at Rensselaer where it was 38 degrees, sideways wind. It was raining. And no, yes. it, yeah. Literally during a global pandemic, a global <laughs> pandemic. And yet I had the time of my life. So it tells you what COVID-19 has done to me. Yeah. Uh, it tells you what it's done to a lot of us. But in all seriousness, you know, Hartford's got a real good soccer culture. A history, you know, my father played in the old NASL. There's a lot of good roots there. It was kind of cool to see how many people went in that weather to enjoy a high-level game. Obviously, the weather had a massive impact on the quality of game. And yet, it was still kind of cool to say, you know what? This area, if they do it right, and quite frankly, if New York City was better at their marketing, could pull that because the New England Revolution haven't done a good enough job in Hartford, Connecticut. There is a soccer culture uh, that that's there. It's been pretty cool to see from my point of view. But the fact that I went to a game that – had nothing to do with me. Uh, Luke, I'm losing brain cells here. <laughs> Listen, I would have given anything to see you and John Champion sitting there with your beers and your cooler and your ponchos on in the, in the stands. First, first off, Luke, do I look like I was drinking beer? It was 100% White Claw, dude. No, but you had a poncho. You must have had a poncho. Beer? No, cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Taylor, you saw TFC live. You've commented on some of their games. You know, obviously they have to play all the games away from home. Maybe yeah. just handicap their chances. What do you think their chances are going into this playoffs? I don't want to play them if no. I was in the Eastern Conference. Uh, it, just because they know exactly the buttons to push when it comes to a tournament. Now, I under it, I, I can't imagine how difficult that was for any kind of father, husband to be away like that. Uh, difficult situation. So I always assessed it, it like, well, hold on here. Like they lose five zero to Philadelphia. It was an awful game, but I'm sitting there thinking, well, Greg gave them two days off before they ended up going to like, you've got to just, I don't want to play Toronto in the playoffs. I don't with their experience. Um, they are a little alarming to me at how many goals they give up just simply at the center back position where there's a lack of reaction or a lack of urgency from that position, that alarms me a little bit because some of the goals they have given up, quite frankly, are crap and aren't good enough. Um, but they've got some game changers. You know, I look at Philadelphia Union. I was listening to you guys before I came on. I agree wholeheartedly. I'm not so sure. I look at that team saying, wait, in a one-off game, it, can they pull off three wins to get? I, I don't see that. Toronto, I do because they've already done it. They've shown they could do it. Um, I don't want to play Toronto to answer your question in the playoffs. If I'm in the Eastern Conference, mm -hmm. I do not want to play them. Taylor, we've got some tantalising matchups. Is there anybody you think might get a bit embarrassed from some of the top seeds in the first game? And, and who do you think might be a kind of outside bet to take home the, the MLS Cup in December? I think it's an interesting question, brother. And the reason why is because I don't like Inter Miami. I don't. Um, Nashville, I like if they advance against Miami, and that's the game we're doing here in ESPN. Well, they got uh, Defender Friday. of the Year. Defender of the Year, Walker's well, they got the Yeah, they got the Defender of the Year, but they gave it to him in a yellow school bus because that's how uh, that, that's kind of how he won it. Now, in all seriousness, Walker Zimmerman's a fantastic defender. Yeah. But, but like, he, hold on. Let, let's start on that real quick. How do we have Defenders of the Year and Best 11s when fullbacks and wingbacks are never on there? Like, what's the point of that? Yeah. I voted for Tinnerholm, just so you know. 
Yeah, like well, what's the point of that? If 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 they're not defenders, then allow them to be in the midfielders' conversation. Yes. They're not. It, they, I, I've always found that interesting. Like you should pick two fullbacks for best eleven. I'm yes. sorry, you should. Um, I I don't. I, but it, to answer your question, Nashville is interesting because I think they can literally go through this the way Portugal went through Euros in 2016, mm-hmm. not win a game, and yet win on penalties or win in some kind of ugly fashion. They've got the ability to pull this off. Gary Smith did it with the Colorado Rapids. He got to mm. MLS Cup, I think it was 2010. Yep. And so they've got that ability. I don't see anyone getting embarrassed. I don't. In saying that, you guys tell me what you expect from San Jose, because I have no idea. Well, Luke's already written them off last night yeah, on TSM. He's got them out already. Last night on TSM, we did our preview show, and I said 2020 will never surprise me again. If San Jose beats Sporting Kansas City, Absolutely. It, won't, it won't shock me at all. And Luke's like, San Jose's not getting to MLS Cup. So me and Stevie are proper rooting them on now, because we'll make him look r- ridiculous. Luke, Luke, you really firmly believe right now, gun to your head, that you know what San Jose is going to do against Sporting Kansas City. I know. I don't know about the first. Then no, there's no way they're going to win MLS Cup. Is what I said. I didn't say get they could to MLS Cup. Cup you said get to in round MLS one. Cup. Wait a minute. Yeah. What? <laughs> look, 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 they had the worst eight game history, eight game stretch in MLS history, and yet they've somehow beaten teams that they yeah, have they no are. business beat. I'm telling you right now, Peter Vermees is yelling at the fourth official now. <laughs> he's already sweating because that is not the game you i i do no. not want to play san jose so scotty in all seriousness Same. they would be the high odds team that you asked me who would get embarrassed i actually think san jose it would not surprise me one bit if they somehow go on this run it also wouldn't surprise me if they lose 5-1 so yeah, no. yeah. No. no i think there's more chance of that happening no easy me. Assistant referee. <laughs> we'll wait and see. Listen, uh, we've got Michael Bradley coming on in a few moments' time. But before we do, we always have the, the Powerade uh, power play of the game. And we're Ooh. going way back in the archives for this. So st- stay with us here, Taylor, as okay. we, we bring this Powerade power play of the game. Do you remember this? I'm sure you do. Eastern I do. It's, a, it's on my phone. I watch it every morning at 8.30 in the morning. <laughs> What a goal. This is an amazing goal. <laughs> Look at that. For those of you who can't see it, because it's grainy standard definition. It, <laughs> it is Taylor Twelman bicycle kick, Eastern Conference Final. It wasn't a foul. And what? I don't care no. what Scott Caldwell tells me right now no. as a center back, no. that was not a foul. Never no a foul. foul. No, no foul. foul. The ball's not even that high, mate. It's lower than your head. It's a brilliant <laughs> That's goal. not saying much. I am 5'10". <laughs> in juice. Look at that. When you score a goal like that, take us through the emotions. Look at that. You don't know what you're doing, do you? Well, if you can read my lips right now, yeah, you can't see it. I looked at Juan Carlos Osorio and I said, "You." <laughs> and the best part is the best part is that that some of the guys on the Chicago bench were kind of like, "Yeah, <laughs> can't say anything to that." Now we had, in all seriousness, we had because this is when the league folded two teams, so we had ten teams. So up until that point, I had played the Chicago Fire eight thousand times. So. <laughs> There was an there was a rivalry there. Chicago Fire fans would send me Christmas cards every year with the the previous year of us losing MLS Cup. And so that was so I would get it in the mail at the stadium, and it'd be a picture of me crying or acting like a baby after losing the, my third MLS Cup final, second one. And so there was always some good jest there. But that goal was uh, that was fun. I mean, it was freezing that night. It was a fun one, and it led us to our fourth. MLS Cup loss, so it's a great memory. <laughs> <laughs> Taylor, before we let you go, I want to ask you about the Revs. We've got the game tomorrow night. Obviously, yeah. all the focus here is on Montreal and Thierry, uh, Thierry Henry. Uh, but the Revs, if they get through, we talk about surprises here with Bruce Arena. He's won five MLS Cups. They're a team that are difficult to break down. They're not going to be a team that you take a, a guy to watch your first ever soccer game and ask him to fall in love with the no. sport. No. But they can, get it, they can get the job done. What are your thoughts on your former team? I actually think they're frustrating to watch. Um, I, I went into this year and, and I'm on the record and I'll stay on the record. When you go out and spend the most money in your franchise history and we all ex players look at it and go, well, wait a minute. We, we, there was a time when you had Shaw Reed Joseph and Clint Dempsey yeah. and Jeff Lorenowitz and Pat Noonan and Matt Reese and Michael Parkers. You had some of the best players this league's ever seen and some winners, well, right? It, 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 but you look at it and say, well, wait a minute, you go out and spend Carlos Hill is one of the best players. If he stays healthy, he may be the best player in Revs history, a fantastic player. And yet when you watch him play, you're like, well, and I know he's been injured. Gustavo Bo hasn't been. Bruce has been, it's been a weird team to me. 
Honestly, I don't like the way they're playing. I don't think they're as proactive as they need to be. And everyone within the revolution circle wants to tell me they're strong at center back. I'm going to beg to differ. If you, if you keep coming to me saying, well, we have four legitimate center backs. I'll look at you and say, you still haven't told me you're starting too. And they're going to tell me it's Henry Kessler and Andrew Farrell. I've seen Andrew Farrell play a ton. Henry Kessler is still under, he's still inexperienced. I think he's still learning how to play. I just, I, I don't think Montreal beats them. But if you're asking me right now to say, you know what? The Revs are going to make a run. I, I'll raise my hand and say, I just don't see it. I, I really don't. We'll wait and see. The Revs are one of the teams that Toronto FC could play in that yep. game on Tuesday night. They can't play Miami. It would be uh, the Revolution, Nashville, or potentially Montreal Impact as well. Uh, just finally, before we let you go, Taylor, your thoughts on Thierry Henry and what he's done this year? Oh, boy. Um, I, I think it's a... I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt, right? Okay, so I'm not going to judge him with anything. I, I think he's got a ma- – in speaking with Thierry Henry, he's got a chip on his shoulder to prove what happened in Europe is just – it's a blimp on the radar. It's part of his growth. To judge Thierry Henry on 2020 is absolutely – we can't do it. My question is more for Montreal. Are you going to give him enough to work with? Yeah. Are you going to give him enough? Because then we don't really know that answer. What I saw, and I, I think you guys even did this on a couple of your shows. I remember watching it. What we saw early on in CONCACAF Champions League, it surprised me a little bit of how pragmatic he was. Because the Thierry Henry that talked to me and that would yell at me after Red Bull games about <laughs> we're not expansive enough and we don't go forward, the Henry that I see as a manager, I'm like, whoa, there's a pragmatism to him. Now, if there is because of what he's got to work with, Luke, Okay, fine. Then then I think that's part of his growth. But is it because he's scarred by what happened? That's different. I, I really will judge Thierry Henry based on what happens next year because I think this year's unfair. But I do think there's a little glimmer of hope that, you know what, Monaco was just a blimp on the radar. I hope so because the game's better with him in it. And, and if it's in our league, it's even better because we need guys with personality. We need guys with identity and we need guys that are not cookie cutter and they have character and they're willing to go out on a limb and do something. This league's better for it, I think. 100%. Thanks for your time, Taylor. Great to see you again. Great to catch up. And uh, we look forward to watching the ESPN broadcast throughout the playoffs here in Canada. Yep. Stay Tell well. Michael I got a better haircut. <laughs> <laughs> see you, man. Be well, my friend. Taylor Twelman with us, uh, ESPN, of course, one of uh, TSN's partners throughout the Major League Soccer on TSN Playoffs. Uh, so we'll be seeing plenty of Taylor and his uh, sidekick, John Champion, or maybe it's the other way around, John Champion and his sidekick, Taylor. Um, but yeah, it's going to be an entertaining few weeks, absolutely. Um, and there we, we heard Taylor talking about his view of Toronto FC, and, and it's interesting. We're very close to it, having seen all the games, having broadcast all the TFC games as well. But even last night, I saw Alexi Lalas doing his bracket prediction on Fox. Um, and he's picking TFC against Seattle in the final once again. And a lot of it comes down to the fact that, like Taylor said with Philadelphia, w- when teams have been there and they know how to win and they've got a lot of those same players there, it, it counts for a lot at this time of the year. Oh, it's an enormous uh, advantage, you know, when you've got that ability to know how to get it done in the past. And, you know, TFC have had that, you know, we, we, we'll speak to Michael about it so many times, but they've had that, those those reference points of positivity and negativity that have allowed them to to, to, to the fuel to push forward for the sustained success. And, and they've done that at a time when a lot of other teams in Major League Soccer haven't been able to do that. Here we are talking about Philadelphia Union, most people's picks to get through the Eastern Conference, certainly on MLSsoccer.com. And they are they are a, a team on the rise, but they haven't done what TFC have done. Columbus, you know, crew have spent a lot of money. They're at the level, as I said last night on TSN's previous show, of where I think TFC were in 2016. You know, they start these playoffs like TFC did against Philadelphia that night when they wanted to try and win that first game of the era and then look what's come. So I think TFC are obviously an older team for a reason, an experienced team, a battle-hardened team, and that should serve them a lot of success going forward in this playoffs. Who do you think, we had Greg Vanny on the show yesterday and he said there was one player that is right now not likely to make it for Tuesday and that everybody else seems to be looking okay moving forward. Uh, Stevie, who, who can that one player not be for TFC to be okay Tuesday night? Oh, it's a great question. Um, the, the first one that comes to mind for me is Piatti. I think he's so important. I think the way that he connects with Pozzuolo, he frees him up because of, of, of his talent as well in this similar area of the park. 
um, and just the combination that they have, I think he's very, very important. Um, and I'd say maybe level just a little bit behind is Richie Larea, the, the impact that he can have on the right or left-hand side from an attacking sense is, is really important to TFC. So out of the, the, the few guys with little niggles, I think they are the two that are in some ways irreplaceable. They're, they're, there's not a you know a, a like for like and someone who can step into that 11 and provide what they both do in the areas. KJ, do you agree? Yeah, I mean, I think I think the Piatti one is is fascinating. You know, we were talking earlier at the beginning of the show. We, we aired the 2019 MLS Cup final last night on TSN, and you know, it was um, as we've discussed many times. I thought a truly fantastic performance by TOC. Um, you know, they they had Seattle on the ropes. You know, they just they, maybe the one thing they didn't have is is that finisher because Josie wasn't able to play and a little bit of pace. Um, in the team, and they've lacked a little bit of that in a wide area. And I think Piatti brings a lot of that. His connections in the team with Pozuelo, you can see that they have a very high IQ together. They get along on and off the field. And I agree. I think obviously, hopefully, he's fit and firing to go because they're you know, it, you know, you don't need me to tell you they're just a very different team with Pablo in in, in it. It's Footy Talks presented by Powerade. Our thanks to Taylor Twelman for joining us. And now Toronto FC captain Michael Bradley uh, joins us on the show as well. Michael, thanks so much for giving up your time to be with us today here on Footy Talks on the eve of the, the MLS Cup playoffs. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Michael. Um, you're back home this week. You've had the opportunity to be back in, in Downsview and training there. Has it been... Um, almost as important as getting ready physically for the playoffs to have that opportunity mentally to be back with the family and, and to be able to be back in a, a normal environment for a little while. Yeah, it's been uh, it's it's been it's been big. There's no two ways about it. Just in terms of uh, you know uh, a change of scenery. You know, Hartford has been amazing. The 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 club has done. The club has done an incredible job in terms of, you know, the hotel, um, making sure that the hotel, we have everything we need in the hotel, making it as, as homey as possible. Um, but the reality is still, they're, they're long days, you know, obviously train and, and, and eat, um, you know, a little bit of treatment, a uh, little bit of extra work in the gym or, or, or whatever it is, but there's still a lot of time to just kill. Right. And now when, when you're home, um, you know, just for everybody to be back with their, you know, back with their families, back in the routine of now, of, of going into going into the training ground, getting our work done there. Um, it's been it's been really really nice. Um, I think mentally, it's uh, it's done us a, a world of a world of good. Michael, I know you've got limitations at home with the modified quarantine, but is it also something to say? And I know it never really leaves leaves you, but that you're representing a city, aren't you? You're representing a badge when you go on the playoffs. Is it something to say that there's something you, pretty special again that you're back here right now to be able to do that and go out again? You're always representing the city, but when you can come back and hang out a little bit at home and, and see the people and the places that you love, that must just add fuel to the fire a little bit more to go and get the job done, surely. Yeah, definitely. You know, the, there's a... There's a, a sense of, you know, when this time of year, when you wake up in the morning and you're driving to the training facility, um, you know, the, the weather is cool, um, big games right around the corner. It's, uh, you know, it, it's, they're familiar feelings and, and, and that's a good thing. And so obviously in a perfect world, we'd be, we'd be getting ready to play at, at BMO on Tuesday night in front of, in front of 30,000 people. But Obviously, that's uh, that's not in the script for this year, and so you know we'll we'll still take every little every little bit of home that we can uh, that we can have, and and you know make sure that we're ready come come kickoff on Tuesday night to to really go for it. Michael, what's twenty twenty been like for you? I know it's been difficult for all of us, but it's been a a tough season in terms of injuries mentally. Has it allowed you to reflect a little bit on? your career, what's to come, what's left and, and stuff like that. Has it, has it been challenging? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's been, it's been frustrating for sure. Um, you know, obviously, you know, it, it's been a stop start year for everybody um, just in terms of, of COVID and, and, you know, everything shutting down. And then when, when, you know, just as we were getting things back going after, after Orlando having to come back and, and, you know, basically go, you know, quarantine at home for another two weeks, go two weeks without any real training. Um, you know, and then obviously when you add in, 
you know, the, the big ankle surgery at the beginning of the year and then the, the MCL injury that I picked up against Montreal. Yeah, it's just been – it's been one of those years, you know. Um, but it's – if anything, it has uh, reminded me how much I love to play, how much I love to, to compete, how much, uh, how much I, 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 I know is still, is still there for me. Um, and so, yeah, for, for me right now, the, the, the focus and the motivation is on, on finishing this season um, in the best possible way. And then, um, you know, using whatever, uh, hopefully little time there is in the off season to, to, you know, keep going and, and really build myself up, you know, continue to build myself up in a good way for, for next season. We've heard from different coaches and players throughout the league about some of the challenges that people have gone through this year. And Thierry Henry talked about it being the toughest thing he's had to do in terms of, you know, his first MLS coaching job and dealing with, he said, when you're a player, you just deal with your problems. But when you're a coach, you have everybody else's problems as well. Um, you're a captain and a leader as well. Have there been times this year when, you know, that leadership has been tested in terms of you having to, to go places that maybe you've not had to before in terms of just generally leading a team? Yeah, for sure. You know, I mean, look, it, it, it's you guys have heard me say this. I mean, and we've talked about it a lot this year, which is just this idea that um, if you wanted, you could find something wrong every single day right now. You know that you if you if you really wanted to, you could pick something apart every single day that wasn't right, wasn't perfect, wasn't, um, you know, wasn't what you you'd hoped <clears throat> you'd hoped it was going to be. And and look, we 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 all do that in in, in little ways. Um, we're we're human, but we've also talked about this idea of, of you know when you look around the world, we're still we're still pretty darn lucky in terms of you know what we have, what we're able to do, um, you know the ability to still uh, train and play games, um, you know, and and look at the end of at the end of this year, they're gonna you know they're gonna they're gonna hit they're going to hand out a trophy to a team and, and, you know, one team's going to get to, to stand up there and, and, and lift it together. And so as long as, as long as that's, as long as that's still in play, then we're going to uh, give everything we have to make sure that is the, the only, the only focus. Um, but for sure, along the way, there has been the need for everybody to, um, you know, just be, be understanding of, of, different situations, understanding of, of, uh, emotions, of feelings, um, you know, and so it's been, uh, it's been, it's been something that's for sure. <laughs> Michael, uh, you have a, a incredible achievement. The fact that you played every minute of every MLS uh, playoff game, this club has ever played in. Um, we're talking about a lot lately and as, as analysts and you've talked a lot about this to mm -hmm. us about the, those reference points, how many times you've been there together over the last few years and how that can help you going forward. I know that 2017 MLS Cup is one that will always stick with you with tremendous pride, not just winning it, but the way that you the way that you won it. Of the 16 MLS playoff games, other than that, is the one that you think of more than any other during that time? Uh, that's a good question. There's been a lot of there's been a lot of you can have you can probably have multiple ones because there's a lot of good answers too right you had a lot of good nights yeah look it, it nobody ever talks about it but in some ways the one that that gets uh that gets lost in the in the shuffle pretty easily is the the first one that we won against philadelphia in 2016 at home um you know there was there was some real pressure that night you know, I mean, given given at that point that, you know, it was the it was my third year it was the third year of, you know, the third year of kind of this 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 project. Um, it was the second year with with uh, with Josie and with Seba. Um, and obviously, you know, look, everyone at the club and everyone in the city was was still really proud of of what we had been able to accomplish the year before making the playoffs for the first time that in some ways, when we lost to Montre Montreal in the way that we did, it, it was got swept under the, the carpet a little bit. Right. And, and it, it certainly didn't on the inside of our group. And, and, you know, the, the goal was always, the goal was never to just make the playoffs, you know, and, and, and I think 
going into that game against Philadelphia, I think there was a, a real sense and a real understanding from amongst everybody that, okay, this was, it was, it was, it's time to put up or shut up a little bit, you know, and that we needed to, we, we needed to now uh, take a real step forward in terms of, you know, okay, we're in the playoffs, but now we've got to win. We've got to, we've got to be a team that can win these big games. And so I think that was, <clears throat> that was certainly, um, that was certainly one that, again, it kind of flies under the radar. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, it was, uh, it was a big night. Um, you know, and then obviously look, the, the, the two that the, the, the series with Montreal, uh, later that, that year was, was, was incredible, you know, hard to think that, uh, that any series, um, you know, any two legged tie, uh, when you look back or even looking forward, it's, it's hard to think how, how anything can match that when you, when you look, when you, when you take everything into account, you know, from the from the the drama before the the first game even started with the lines at, at uh at olympic stadium and then you know going down three zero and, and thinking to yourself this can't be happening again to then the you know the, the return leg in toronto and the weather and just the the way it all played out that was that was special michael someone asked me a, a really interesting question i thought the other day and it was did you love winning or did you hate losing and I think that the second part of my question is, I want to ask that of you. I think you're, you're a fascinating guy to ask that of. But the second part is, you know, a, a guy like you who's had enormous wins, some agonizing defeats, particularly here in MLS with TFC, is winning ever enough? Is there ever a point where you feel you feel satisfied? I think I know the answer to this, but, you know, <laughs> do you ever experience enough winner or do you just want more? The minute you get that success, the hunger's there just to go again and pick up another trophy. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, that 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 hunger and that drive is 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 always there, um, and and it it is, it's so true that the 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 high and the the joy and the 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 positive emotion that comes when you win, uh, it doesn't last anywhere near as long as the 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 pain and the the frustration and the disappointment when when you lose. Um, so, so that part is, that, that part is, is, is real. Um, you know, I think, I think as, as, as I've gotten older, I, I think I've also, you know, we, we, I think I've also been able to come to grips a little bit with this idea of, of that, that not everything is so black and white that, uh, you know, you guys know me. I, I'll I'll give anything and everything I have to to win and to to you know be the the one you know be the one team that that's standing on the podium at the end lifting that trophy. But along the way, you know the there you know when you look back, there is still there is still success in in reaching finals. There is still success in um, the consistency that we've been able to do that, you know, the way that we've played the, you know, what we have been about in some of the, you know, some of the, the, you know, some of the biggest moments, you know, and, and you can, you can think to the, you know, last year's final, um, you know, the way that we were, the way that we went to Seattle and were able to play, um, the way that we were, you know, on on turf in a stadium like that, um, the way we were the way the way we were able to put the game on our terms, um, you know, they end up breaking through with uh, with a with a, a a deflection, you know, and that kind of breaks the game open. Um, you know, if you look, obviously, Champions League in in 2018 or the or MLS Cup in 2016, you lose on penalties and and how you know how small the margins are. Um, but again, even you know if you take Champions League in 2018, you look at the you look at the way that we were able to play. You look at the experiences that that we had, what we had to go through to get there. And and again, there's yes, we didn't we didn't win that tournament. We didn't lift the trophy, but. Um, Anybody who tries to, to, you know, anybody who tries to knock us for, for, uh, you know, for being a team that has now lost a few finals like that, yeah, 
that everybody's free to to judge however they want but i certainly i see it in a different way it's incredible as well when you go back through some of those games and and stevie you mentioned it a little bit last week with scotland and when you're when you when you're reaching these major tournaments and you see your country there every single time you think it's just going to go on forever and then all yeah. of a sudden with scotland it stopped in 1998 and they're only just getting back to the euros now um must feel at times like that michael the the, the tfc the, that winning culture that you've instilled is going to go on forever, but you, you have to savor those moments because you know that it doesn't last like that in sports. Yeah, you have to enjoy them. You have to savor them. You have to, to you know, you have to enjoy every every second, every part of it, every, every little thing that goes into it. And you also then have to understand that um, – you nothing is you have to earn everything every time over again you know that that nothing is you know on tuesday night in in hartford when when we kick off you know, whoever we're playing against doesn't care what we've done or you know how many times we've done this or that they they're they're thinking of themselves um yeah this is this is our time this is our chance to to now to to go on a real run and to to you know push push ourselves into that top top category of teams in the league. And so, you know, the, the, the understanding from every guy to always know, to, to, to find that balance between being proud of what we have done and proud of, of what we have been about um, over the course of a bunch of years, but also understand that uh, you have to, you know, you have to earn it every single time when that whistle blows again. And, and, you know, there's, Oh, the longer that you are able to have, some some consistent success the more that teams are coming after you the more that teams are trying to you know knock you knock you down and so um yeah there's a there, there's two sides to it for sure michael it is award season in mls we're talking off the top of the show about some of the award winners and obviously mvp will be coming up in the next couple of weeks as well alejandro pazuelo a favorite for that he certainly got our vote um what's it been like with him this season for you both on the field and unfortunately for you being off the field and being able to observe it a little bit differently. What have you noticed from him this season? Yeah. I mean, his, his, his ability to score goals and set up goals is, is incredible. Um, and obviously, you know, in a year like this, when, you know, with so many games, obviously, um, you know, we've had to, uh, mix and match and chop and change a little bit in, in moments in terms of who's been on the field and who, how we've played and who's played where, but his ability to, you know, impact games in the most important ways and, um, you know, uh, you know, show up in the right spaces at the right times. And then, you know, his eye for, his eye for final passes is, is, is incredible. You know, the way that he can see, he can see these windows um, in between defenders, in between the defender, in between the defender, defender and the goalkeeper. Um, you know the way that he can then, you know, wait certain passes. Um, you know, on the on the ground. Um, you know his ability to, to, you know, when he drifts out right to play the, you know, to curl the ball behind the de the defense in front of the goalkeeper. Um, you know, he his ability to to you know, play some of these passes and, and you know, again, come away with, with important goals and assists. That part has been, you know, that, that part's been incredible. Michael, I want to ask you about another one of your teammates and a guy that you've been alongside for a number of years, Jonathan Azorio. I think you're probably better than anyone to analyse the growth in him as a man and, and obviously as a football player. What have you seen, you know, and where is he now and how how high can he go? Because he still looks like, to me, he's improving and he's got a lot of great years ahead of him. Yeah, listen, Oso is... Uh, uh, he, he, it's, it's, it's amazing for me because obviously, you know, I, I can remember... I can remember my first preseason in Bradenton, Stevie, when, when we were, you know, not long after I had gotten here when, you know, we were sitting on the bus one day and, you know, obviously I, I didn't, it's not like I knew every single guy coming into, into the group. And I can remember after like the first or second day asking you about Oso and, and basically saying like this, this, this kid, he can play, you know, like how, what's his best spot? How are we going to, how are we going to make sure that we, we get the best out of him and keep it, you know, pushing him forward because it took, 
like I said, it took one session to see the the, the quality that he has, the football that he has in him. Um, you know, he's it, he's fun to play with. You know, he 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 takes the right number of touches. He he understands how to move. He gives you the ball when it's good for you and not good for and and, and not good for him. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, look, the, the, the experience that we've had on the field together, um, you know, we, we've stepped on a field on a lot of big day, a lot of big days and a lot of big nights over the last few years. And, and, you know, certainly the, the trust and the confidence that he and I have in, in each other, um, that part that, you know, that that's hard to find. And then if, you know, certainly when you, you add in Marky to the equation and, and the ability that you know, the, the, the midfield that we've been, been able to have on, on some of these days, that part has been a real strength. Um, you know, and, and so look for, for me also is, is a guy who he loves to play. He loves to train. He, he, he works. Um, so he's going to continue to get better and better. Um, you know, he's, he's versatile as well. You know, I mean, he can play, he can play, as a as a two way midfielder, he can play as an attacking midfielder. He can play, you know, tilted. Um, you know, if you want to play him as a more of a like a, a winger coming off the left and letting him come inside and find space in between lines, he can do that. And and look, I I said uh, I said to a few a, a bunch of people this year, um, he and Marky both deserve big credit for the way that they were able to uh, both tweak little parts of how they would typically play and, and, and make sure that the team didn't skip a beat in the, in the games that I missed, you know, because obviously you know, on, on a lot of days, the three of us played together and, and the, the, the relationships and the balance in the midfield is one thing, but obviously when I wasn't on the field, the, the, the intelligence and the maturity that both of those two guys showed to be able to, you know, and, and quality that the, that those guys were able to show in terms of, again, making sure that the team had football and balance and, and still was successful. That part, uh, that part was, was at a high level. And so they, they both deserve big credit for that. Michael, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate you being with us here on Footy Talks. Uh, best of luck for the playoffs as you get set to head back to Hartford over the weekend. Thanks, thanks Michael. Michael. Michael, good luck. All right. All right. TFC captain Michael Bradley with us on Footy Talks. A couple of minutes left to wrap up this week's show. Um, so many great memories there when Michael Bradley talks about all those different things that have happened. And I was doing some um, research this morning for the game tomorrow night, the Montreal Impact game. Um, when you think that that was the last time they played in a postseason game back in 2016 there, everything that, say, TFC have experienced or Seattle have experienced from that day until now, um, even like a, a New England side, they were in the playoffs last year for the first time since 2015. These teams that have been in, in playoffs in the past, like LA Galaxy, who now see themselves on the outside. Um, TFC know from two years ago when they didn't make it in that, you know, it doesn't take much to, to lose that um, that footing if things start to go wrong, but you've got an awful lot of a lot more of an opportunity if you if you have that um, that ability within your squad to to dig deep on occasions when things are, aren't going your way and look back on some of those moments, like Michael said, um, when you've been into difficult places and, and played really well, even though you might not have got the results, KJ. Yeah, sustainable success is really difficult to achieve in sports. And there's some teams in a lot of sports that are able to do it a lot better than others. And and it works on and off the field. You know, incompetence off the field leads to incompetence on it. And while the team is pushing forward, it's absolutely paramount that the team behind that team is working on how do we make this team better and not resting on your laurels. So as the team is allowed to reference what's gone on in the past, because when they get on the field, it does help them. The way Michael talked there about the opposition not caring, that's the that's what if I'm in the upper, upper management, Stevie, that's what you need to think about. How do we continue to evolve this team to push them forward, not just fall over a cliff? and eventually go, okay, we're going to keep pushing, 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 and then we're going to have three or four years of, of failure because of it. You don't want to you know, pay for what you've had. You want the success to continue over time. And I think that, T that for me now is the biggest challenge of TFC going forward. It's one that they can definitely do, but they have to do if they want to continue to have these special nights because, as you can see in Michael's eyes, he just lights up when he talks about them. I'm so glad he mentioned that Philly game. You guys know what that – I've talked to you guys about that yep. so many times. 
Um, and that, Stevie, as you know, is what sticks with you as an ex-player, those big nights and how can you get more of them because they're infectious, aren't they? Yeah, they are very infectious. You, you just want to keep winning. You want to keep performing at that high level. And I, I agree with you. I think the, the the team behind the team is very important. They always ask the question, how can we improve? How can we tweak things? How can we get even better? You have to have that mindset that is never enough, basically. You're always trying to improve your, your squad, your roster, your, your performances, your tactics. Um, but the one thing that I want to say is that it's the same mindset within the changing room, within that squad, the players as well, in terms of, you know, we as an outside group watching, the, calling their game, watching the game, wherever you may be within that, you see the 90 minutes of a performance between normally Saturday to Saturday, but this season it's been, you know, Saturday, midweek, Saturday um, is one thing. But you don't get there without the work in between. And it needs to be consistent, guys. It needs to be every day. There's principles put in place, uh, you know, processes in terms of how you train and how you behave and how you act as, as, as a squad, as, as human beings, you know. And, and these guys have got that right. The point I'm trying to get to is that that's what they've done so well for five or six years. There's been enormous highs. There's been terrible lows, you know, and there's been even a season where there wasn't a playoff appearance. But the stuff that they've done off the field mentally – and in the training ground has really stood them in good stead to be consistent, to keep it up, to keep the big boss moving along, to improve little bits along the way, player here, player there, and to put themselves in another magnificent position to go and achieve success again in this 2020 playoff campaign. It will be New England Revolution, Nashville or Montreal on Tuesday night in East Hartford, Connecticut for Toronto FC to open up the postseason. Every game live, of course, on MLS on TSN, starting tomorrow night with the impact at New England Revolution and followed by Nashville against Inter Miami. Uh, can't wait to get started with the, the MLS postseason. Thanks to everyone for being with us on Footy Talks. Uh, we'll see you again next week. Have a good week. Everyone, hey everyone, hey everyone, welcome to Footy Talks. Footy Talks, Footy Talks, presented by Powerade. We are live with your Thursday Footy Fix.